Okay, my outstanding friends, we're going to have a couple of examples. I'm going to show you how this magnetism works in the cashmere effect, and it also accounts for Brownian motion. Now, the reason I'm going into this is because I've noticed I've been spewing out a dipole electron flood theory and sending it to all the top physicists and, and interacting here and there. You don't get a lot of interaction. They don't like to hear about it. But it's so obvious that it's becoming hard for them to ignore it anymore. And I can account for all of the things that they can't account for. All of the things. But it changes everything that we know about physics right now. I mean, literally everything. And so uh, I am going to show you Brownian motion and the magnetic fields and the fields that are in space, which they say is empty. It's not empty by any means, first of all. Secondly, it's saturated with these fields. I am going to introduce another little tiny magnet into this area. How far away do you think I have to get before it affects that magnet? All right, think about that for a second, and then we're going to do it. All right, so don't forget, in a minute or two, we're going to see how close you have to get these magnets to each other. So how much is the field surrounding them? This points to the Casimir effect. Now it says, it, if the effect arising from the quantum theory of electromagnetic radiation, which is a field, in which the energy present in empty space, they would consider this empty space, outer space is not empty at all anyway, but it has nothing to do with empty space. It says it might produce a tiny force between two objects. All right, so they're saying there's two objects in space and there's some kind of tiny force when they get next to each other. It's not a tiny force, a huge force. It's very, very large and it's normally neutral so they sort of get really close. I agree with that. But once you make them polar, it's an enormous field. So what happens on all all matter, it's coated with with particles that are called the electron neutrinos. And they are the things that bounce light back to you. Inside of that is the dark matter. And that's that I'm gonna show you that right now. And don't forget, we're talking about this little tiny field in empty space. Well, it's, first of all, space isn't empty. Let me show you fields in space. You want to see this? Check this out. These, my friends, are fields in space. That is, I believe, Venus. And that's the moon. And these are all dipoles in space creating huge, huge, huge magnetic fields. Any other thing that comes close to this has to push into that expanding field. All right, so I am going to put this magnet close to these two in a second. But what I want you to know is there is a tiny little particle in the center of this field. And the field is what, what you're going to find out when I put this near those magnets, how close I get is the field. I'm bumping my field into their field. So this has a big round ball around it, which is magnetism. And that does as well. And every particle there is does. So as this light wave passes through and it's made of the tiniest particles there are, light, it has to push through everybody else's field. That's why all those little particles are glowing. They're little gases and so forth, oxygen, nitrogen, and it has to pa pass through them. So it gets excited because its field is being concussed. These get a little bit excited because it has to pass through. Now, how close will we have to get to these little particles to make them interact? That will tell us the size of the fields that we're talking about. All right, and I'm going to show you exactly what particles are made of and how they work. So let's go down and look at this. All right, there's those two. Now, I'm going to come up this way. I got this little piece here. Watch, watch what happens. <laughs> All right, that one goes. You see it? You 
You don't have to get all that close. All right, so they have a big field around them. When they, those fields bump, they push apart. That's what causes Brownian motion and it causes the Kashmir effect. It's the fields bumping into the other fields. The particles are way inside. All right, you see that? That right there is Brownian motion. And what it means is these particles will get close to each other, but they won't really touch. Very rare that they touch. Uh, and they just sort of jiggle around and move around. And they have no explanation for why that happens. Well, some people think they do, but I can tell you precisely why it happens. is because the light is hitting on those particles. And when it bounces into the particles, the particles move. All right? and it, in addition to other particles are moving as they absorb light too. Light is not consistent everywhere in the same place, but light can force the fields of other particles to move. You see this? This is Brownian motion. These are things that are getting close to each other and they're just sort of jiggling around. And they're different sized particles so they jiggle at different rates. But they can't understand why these things should be moving. They should just be laying there still. The light is coming in and, and bouncing against them is what's causing them to, to push and move around. All right. As I showed you before, the Kashmir effect says two particles come next to each other and they bounce back from each other. Well, this is the light particle coming through the air and it's, acceler it's, it's bouncing into all these other particle fields because these fields are huge. So it's exciting them, and they are all jiggling around, of course, in front of this. Now, this is just a big laser that's coming in, but even the tiniest little bit of light will jiggle these. Just a little bit, they'll jiggle around a little bit, they'll stay away from each other, and they'll just jiggle around. Uh, now, if you didn't have any light source, whatever, no additional energy going into there, they would just find their, their own place, and they would just basically stay there. But whenever you're adding any energy at all, and that's heat or light, it doesn't matter, it's the same thing, it would cause these things to jiggle a little bit, and then they're going to bounce around and roll around. And the same thing happens with the Crookes radiometer. It does, it's not just light. Heat will do the same thing to make it go. Heat is nothing more than these same particles just going slower. The faster they go, the brighter they get. And you start with red, and then green, and then blue, and then complete white light is just all the frequencies. All right, this is exactly the same particles that we found. These are from Fermilab. They're supposed to be the smallest particles that exist. Now listen to this. What before when I said if there's any light shining on it, it's going to it's going to interact with the molecules that were there. The same thing happens with their experiments and they don't even understand this. Look at this. Look at this. It says, if you magnify an extended particle, that's, which is the black one, it will look just bigger. It's, just, it's never going to change size, but a point-like particle will not change in size. But the more closely you look at it, the stronger the field surrounding it becomes. That's the stronger the field because you're pushing against it with another... When they say the harder you look at it, it means the more light you put on it. It's going to get glowier and, and it's going to push back. This is really crazy. The observer effect has always been considered to be a form of reactivity in which subjects modify an aspect of their behavior in response to knowing that they are being looked at. The light doesn't have any ideas being looked at. You're taking or pushing light into it or sucking out, which is a charged couple. You're taking energy out or you're shining light in. It's one or the other. That just changes it. And they don't realize this at Fermilab. It's unbelievable. Look at this. This is the point, point particle that we found, which is the fixed particle. Never changes. This is the one that gets big and small. If you magnify the extended particle, it just gets bigger. If you magnify it, it just gets bigger. It'll look bigger, that's all. The point like, which is this one, will not change in size, but the more closely you look at it, the stronger the field surrounding it becomes. That's because you're pushing against this field. That's all. And here's what he says. It's the same thing that I say. 
Extended particles, the black one, have a fixed size, they never change, they have a fuzzy edge around them, yes. The point-like particles are abstractions to zero size, and I agree, they don't seem to have any weight whatsoever. But even zero size particles have extended field due to the effect of the field surrounding them. If there's no particle there, I don't know, I really don't know where that field comes from. It's got to be something similar to like a really fine um, soap bubble type of thing that can get big and get, gets tiny. Because that's exactly what we saw. And here's the particles. It, it, no difference whatsoever. Precisely what we found. Here's our particles, the same particles that they found. Here they are, here, here. But this is in light. They're using huge, huge particles. These are supposed to be the most elementary particles there are. And I guess they are because they're inside of light. But we were able to split those by putting them through this venturi. There's that light particle. Boom, and explodes and breaks into pieces. And that's what they have been trying to do, is to create fission and fusion. And that's it right there. That's fission and that's fusion. We accelerated these particles. When they hit the Venturi, all bets were off. The black stayed this side, the white showered through, and that's what they want to see, a muon, sh just black ball all by itself. It's called sterile muon. And the electron shower comes through. This should, we should be able to get free electricity by using this method of separating the black from the white. That's the only, uh, we didn't use any, any extra energy whatsoever to separate them. Normally you have to put this in the generator and it goes, rawr, 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 rawr. it pushes the black away from the white. And then rawr, 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 rawr. that's how the generator works. And then you collect up all the white and put it in your battery. All right, during the time I was doing this research, I saw Fermilab stuff, and I contacted them. They told me to never contact them again because I was crazy. And I also contacted the Russians, and they were much nicer. They actually created a black hole in space. You see that? These are all charged particles put in here, and they all came in, and they all swirled around, and before long, they whoop, 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 and this started to form in the center. The only reason it's oblong like that is there's still gravity here. This is in a, in a, um, a vacuum chamber in the Soyuz, or whatever they call it, their space station. And they injected these charged particles. I expected to see them line up in rows like this and like this in, a, in like a cubic, you know, separation like that. And then this happened. They freaked out. During the experiment, we contacted the Earth guys who couldn't believe it either. Everybody was freaked out. One guy from Max Planck went in his office for three weeks and never, nobody ever saw him. <laughs> it was, it just didn't react. And, and, and they didn't realize it was a black hole. I said, it's a black hole. And the same thing I told the Fermilab. I said, I, I found your particles. Here they are right here. These are particles you had. Here's our particles. Don't ever contact us again. <laughs> I said, well, what are you going to do? That was eight years ago. You see this? This is a Crookes radiometer. All I have to do is shine light on this, and if I hit the black with it, it spins. You see it? I can hit the white. If I go right onto the white only, it doesn't, it, it doesn't slow it down. It keeps spinning faster. The light forces these things to spin. Now, I did a big long thing on this, and nobody understands this either. 150 years, this toy, nobody understands. I understand it. And it has to do with the glass. <laughs> Nobody's ever taken the glass into account. If you are on this side of the glass, you get a sunburn. If it's a, you know ultraviolet light. If you're on the other side of the glass, you don't get a sunburn. So obviously, the glass is taking some of the energy out of the light. Anyway, that's a whole other issue. I did a big long thing on this. I've studied that for a couple of years now. And I, I understand it. I'm almost 100% sure. But we're talking about the Casimir effect. We're talking about Brownian motion. We're talking about dipole electron flood theory, which solves everything, including gravity, including dark matter, including all of these things. Anything that you can come to me with in physics, anything, I don't care what it is, I can tell you, I feel I can using dipole electron flood theory, exactly what you're looking at and why it's to do and what it does. And I can tell you right now, we are, we have no idea where we are in space. This is what's in space. 
all the particles coming at us are being slowed down in this medium. There's no question whatsoever. It's absolutely certain. But they say, no, 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 it's a redshift. It's all pulling away from us, making it slow down. No, it's just slowing down. All right, these are the smallest particles that exist, the Dirac neutrinos, the white part attached to the black part, and that's what it is right there. There's no possible way you can miss this. It's impossible. It's impossible. And what I'm showing you is they, they, they all have these big fields around them, and they're, they're the same thing in space. Anything that's a dipole has a field around it, and everything there is is a dipole. The bigger the dipole, the bigger the, the, the field. And the more magnetic it is, the more separation of polarities, the stronger the field is. That's why magnets, they pull it together. But even anything, you touch these two rocks together, and they have a cashmere effect. The same thing, it's trying to push each other apart. That's why things bounce away from each other. And gravity is nothing more than this black part. Gravity is, is, uh, is the attractor, basically, of the white parts. And coming through this venturi, they separate here, but boy, the back tries as hard as it can to get back into the white. And the black will always be behind the white, except here. The only reason we can see that black is because it's sitting on top of the white, obscuring the white from coming at us. That's why we've never seen black matter, dark matter, because it's inside of the white matter. This is all the glowy stuff that bounces back at you, but that's what the core is, is the dark matter. The core is positive dark matter muons, and the outside is the negative electron dipoles, the, the, the dipole of the electron. This is the only two particles that exist, the only two that exist. And when they're together, this is basically a standard electron. We always thought the electron was just a glowy part. Normally they're together, but when you separate them, that's when you create electricity. An electron will move in to is heat and so forth. But electricity is just the white part. Has no weight whatsoever that I can find. And when you add the two of them together, just like I showed you, was the dipole photon. And this is dipole electron flood theory. Solves everything. So I just showed you Brownian motion. I showed you um, the cashmere effect, dark matter, <laughs> gravity, anything, anything. I mean anything. Any single thing that you can ask about, I can just explain from dipole electron flood theory. I know it's a big, big claim, but it's true. My boss used to say, if, it, if, if it's true, it ain't bragging. So I love you all. This is the new thing. We just got to get away from the standard model. It never worked. It still doesn't work. They can't explain gravity and no dark matter. They just have no idea what they're doing. And they can't, isotopes, it's just crazy. They can't possibly figure out isotopes. There's all kinds of different particles between each atom. Atom's not just an atom. It's, got, it's made up of all of these little particles together. Hydrogen is like that. Instead of one big positive and a little tiny negative, it's 1,825 or so of these, which are magnetic dipoles. And they add together. When they hit 1825 or so, boom, they become stable. You get more than that, they're unstable. You get less than that, they're unstable. That's the whole idea with isotopes. And there is a zillion of them. So they can't, they can't account for that whatsoever. I was in a big meeting with a bunch of physicists yesterday. You know, as soon as I mentioned isotopes, who can explain it? It just shut right down. You know, nobody could explain it. It's, it's unexplainable with the standard model. They know that. They call it physics beyond a standard model. There it is. I love you all. Bye-bye.